Amen. So for those who have been with us for the last couple of weeks, we've been uh, on this subject, Divine Elevation, which is also our theme for the year 2020. And God has been uh, unraveling, has been unveiling himself to us every week, and uh, he's taking us higher. He is taking us higher. And uh, if you are here and uh, you've missed out on some of these messages that are being ministered out of this place every Friday night and Sunday morning, you need to catch up online. You can find them online. We don't want anyone to be left behind. We all want to go higher together. Though sometimes it's very difficult because this one thing I, I got to learn. Uh, when the rocket, this, uh, we all know the rockets, right? It's about to head to the space. It leaves, it leaves the ground attached to some part of it. But when it gets to a certain level, it re releases what it, was being, what it was standing on. And then it goes higher. I pray that you won't be among that part that is always left behind by the rocket while it goes higher. If you have an ear, let you understand what the Spirit is saying. We all want to go higher together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last Sunday or the week before we saw, we, we were looking at uh, the things that make the church of Jesus Christ as a whole increase, not just spiritually, but also numerically and in every way. And first we saw that uh, behind every growing church is the God of increase. It is God that brings increase in his house. He is the one who says in his word through the Apostle Paul that I planted, another one watered, that is Apollos, but God brings the increase. So we see that there's a part that we need to play as a church to plant the seed, which is the word of God, and we saw that two weeks ago. Then last Sunday we saw that behind every growing church is Jesus Christ, who is the master builder. He is the one who is building the church. We are the church of Jesus Christ, and he is the one who said, Upon this rock, I will build my church, not our church. It is his church, and we are part of the body of Christ. We are part of the church, and no gates of hell shall prevail against it. And we saw that uh, it is him that is the chief cornerstone, while every one of us is just living stones, but we are aligned to the living stone. He is the son of God. And there's one thing I came to learn also back, uh, some time back, that he is the son of God. And the Bible says that he is the light of the world. But you know, when the scripture, when you read the book of John, chapter 5, the Bible says that he is this, the light of the world. But as you continue reading, the, the scriptures end up saying that we have become the light of the world. Not just Jesus Christ, but you and me are the light of the world. Because Jesus now is in us, and he is the light. And as long as we align with him, we reflect his light. We radiate his light. It's just like the moon. Did you know the moon has no light of its own? What happens to the moon, what makes it shine at night, is because it is always aligned to the sun. So while the sun is setting, the moon is rising at night, and it's simply aligned to the sun, and it reflects the light of the sun and causes to produce light in the night. So to the, not to the magnitude of the sun, but it still reflects the light. Why? It is aligned to the sun. And if you have the sun of God in you, you have to reflect that light as well. Because Jesus is the son of God. The S-O-N, not the S-U-N. The son of God. So when we are aligned to Christ, we are able to draw many to Christ. Because he says that if we lift him up, he will draw men, not to us, but to himself. And today we are going to go a little deeper, and we're going to our theme scripture. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2. So if you'd stand up for the reading of the word, let's read it to, this together, and then uh, we will be able to go to the next thing that we're going to share this morning. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. I'm sure all of us have memorized this by today. Let, let's write, Courtney, don't, actually don't pull it out, don't pull it out. Let, let, let's see, we've read this scripture every week since Jan December 31st. Let's see, Isaiah 2 2. No, Courtney. Courtney, you're cheating. <laughs> Courtney, I I'll see you after the service. 
<laughs> no, that won't help still. <laughs> okay, this is going to be a test. Next Sunday, we're going to quote this scripture by memory. Okay, oh, thank you, Courtney. Let's go. In the last days... Uh, Kimuel is cheating right there. You got a phone, right? I see you. <laughs> yeah, you try. You really tried hard. I give you a round of applause. <laughs> and in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be exalted above every mountain. It shall be the most important place on earth. And the, this mountain shall be exalted above every hill. And people from all nations shall stream there to worship God. They shall stream there to love God and to honor him for who he is. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are here in your presence. We acknowledge, O oh God, that you are the God of all creation. You are the God of wonders beyond all galaxy. You created the heavens, the earth, and everything that even is under the earth. And Lord, you say that it was good. And we thank you that this morning we are here in your presence. Lord, to learn from you and to take us even to higher ground and higher heights as you declared in your word. And this morning we are here seated at your feet to learn of you and help us, oh God, this morning, even Lord Jesus Christ, to become those people, oh God, that when the world will look at, Lord, they will say that we want to be like them just because of what you are doing in us and even through us. So help us this morning to receive every word that is coming out of this place and transform us for the better to the glory and honor of your name. We thank you that your spirit is here to give us understanding and revelation of your word. For we know that without you, we can do nothing. So we submit to your will. We submit to your spirit and we submit to your ways. Do only what you can do in this place and be glorified at the end of it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in his presence. So behind every growing church is God, the God of increase. Behind every growing church is Jesus Christ who is the master builder. And then the third one I'm going to share with us this morning is that behind every growing church is the Holy Ghost, the Lord of the harvest. Behind every growing church is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit are the same. These are not two different people. When you hear the ghost, you're like, oh, wow. <laughs> like, uh, what do you call it? Halloween or something? Ghost. No, this is a Holy Ghost, a Holy Spirit. He is the one that is also behind every growing church. Now, when you read the book of Acts, we see that the church was dormant before the day of Pentecost. The church was just there. There was no power. And the Bible says that uh, in Acts 1.8, Jesus said these words, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So they didn't have any power. But the Bible says, you will receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. I want you to say that with me. I, just personalize this and say, I will receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon me. So in other words, they didn't have power. So how did they operate? No, they were not in the dark. This is how they operated. They were dependent on Jesus at that time. Jesus was present with them. So they, everywhere Jesus was, they were walking with him. They saw Jesus perform all these miracles, and they also were used in different ways to perform some miracles. But in this scripture, Jesus is about to ascend back to the Father, and he tells them, you will receive power after the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. I love the New Living Translations. Telling people about me everywhere. That's who a witness is. Telling people 
everywhere about me or telling people about me everywhere. Now, that word power, in, in Greek, it means dunamis. Dunamis meaning that it is the, gives one the ability, the, the enthusiasm, the strength to do the things that they are, they are supposed to do. So without the Holy Spirit, they could do nothing. And Jesus promised them and told them that he is not leaving them as orphans. As I am leaving, I'm going to send a comforter. And he will enable you to do all the things that I am I've called you to do. And you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That is a promise that Jesus was leaving with his disciples. And then he told them, as we all know, to go and tarry in that upper room in Jerusalem and wait for that promise. Don't try to go do ministry there. Remember, I am leaving, so I am not with you. You have no covering. Jesus covered them while he was present. But as he descended, he instructed them, don't leave this place until the promise comes, the Holy Ghost. And they waited. And we saw through all this uh, series that when we did a couple of weeks back, that it took 50 days from the day Jesus resurrected from the dead until he ascended to the Father. It took 50 days which number five comes from penta, pentagon. That's where we find the, the meaning pentagon. That means 50. And the Holy Spirit descended upon them. And it is also in the same way in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus 20, when God made a covenant with the, Old Test, with the Israelites in the Old Testament, it took them 50 days from the day they left Egypt when they were in the wilderness until they got the covenant sealed by the, by the Lord God Almighty. It took 50 days. So 50 is a significant number in the scriptures. And there's a prophetic word that came out, I don't know if you guys heard, uh, a couple of weeks back, just before Super Bowl last Sunday, and uh, someone sent me that link from YouTube, and he prophesied, and he said, uh, the chiefs were going to win. Anybody heard that prophecy? You heard that dinner? And uh, he said, when they win, not if, but when they win, there's going to be a revival. Why? Because it took the chiefs 50 years before they got to the Super Bowl. And they won, right? They came back 10 points down and, and won the game. 50 years later, they had not been to, in, to Super Bowl in 50 years. And the 50th year, they won. And it was a prophetic word that came forth. So there is a revival coming. There is an outpouring, a fresh outpouring that is coming to this land. So we see that we cannot operate without the power of the Holy Spirit. He is the one behind every growing church. He is the one who is the Lord of the harvest. In the book of Acts chapter 2 verses 37, we see this so very clearly. Look, Acts 2, 37 through 41. Peter's words pierced their hearts. Now, that is powerful. Those are not just the words of Peter, but, but in the, for the writing purposes, Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they say to him and to other apostles, brothers, what should we do? After hearing these words, the people that had gathered around there, they started asking the apostles, what should we do? Because those words were so powerful. The word of God says in Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is active and alive. It's sharper than any two-edged sword that pierces through the bones and the marrows. That's how powerful the word of God is. And that is what was coming out of Peter, Peter's mouthpiece. And brothers and sisters said, what should we do? Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. Peter was not joking with them. Repent your sins and turn to God. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, this was after Pentecost. This was after they had received the promise from heaven that God had told them to wait and tarry in Jerusalem, in that room. And after Peter, who was a coward, we all know, the Peter who slashed a Roman soldier's ear trying to defend Jesus, the Peter who was so fearful when he stepped out of the boat and he started sinking was the very same Peter that was full of the Holy Ghost and preached the gospel. And he told them, turn to God 
turn from your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away. This promise was not just for them. It was not just for the, for the 120 that were in the upper room. But Peter was telling them, this is not just for us. It is for you, it is for your children, and for those who are far away. For those who are unborn, unborn yet. For those that have not received the Holy Spirit. This Spirit is for everyone. Now, the Holy Spirit was revealed in the New Testament. But the Holy Spirit has been there from the beginning. When you go to Genesis 1, you find the Holy Spirit there. The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was void and without shape. And it was dark. Darkness filled the earth, covered the earth. And the Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God. In Hebrew, it is called, he's called Ruach. Means the very presence of God. The Spirit of God is the very presence of God. And he was all over the earth. And we see him also in the Old Testament still working his works, but for an appointed time. He would come and ascend on prophets, and they would prophesy or do the works they were supposed to do, and after that, he would depart from them. And after that, we see him being introduced in the New Testament. But in the New Testament, he is not coming to visit. He is coming to dwell in us. That is the best place of all. That's the best part I love about this generation, that he is living in us. He's not visiting us, but he is living on the inside of us. And Peter tells them, this promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away. All who have called by, by the name of the Lord, or God. Then Peter continued preaching. This is after answering their question, what should we do? Peter answered them, and he didn't stop there. After he answered them, he continued preaching. And here, and he continued preaching for a long time. Are you ready to hang out with me for another hour of preaching? Oh, we're in America, Pastor. So I hear someone saying that. We, 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 we are scheduled. You know, we are programmed. This is from here. I've already programmed. 11.30, I'm meeting someone. At 12.45, I should be having my lunch. Program. But Peter preached, continued preaching for a long time. And the people were there listening. They didn't complain. He preached for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. The power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord of the harvest. Peter was not just preaching his words. Peter was not just speaking his mind. He was speaking under the influence. He was under the unction of the Holy Ghost. And the unction enabled him to function. You cannot function without the unction. The unction is the Holy Ghost. It is the power of God. It is the Spirit of God. It is the Ruach. Ruach. Without him, we cannot function on this earth. We will try to do some things, but Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. We need the Holy Spirit. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2 verses 4 that my, my message and my preaching is not just of man's wisdom and enticing words, but of demonstration and of power. Paul did not just preach words to entice and make you feel good and uh, get goosebumps and like, yeah, the spirit was there. No, he was preaching under the influence with demonstration and with power. That is what the work of the Holy Ghost does. One scholar said that the great sin of the Old Testament is that they did not believe in God. The great sin of the Old Testament, they never believed in God. The, the great sin of the New Testament is that they never believed in Jesus. He came to his own. His own did not receive him. And the great sin of our generation is that we don't believe in the Holy Ghost. Think about that for a moment. When we used to live in Minnesota, I remember, uh, you know, I do music. I've been doing music almost 
more than half of my life. And uh, I was looking for space to go and conduct my classes because I used to teach from my apartment classes. And so I went to this church that was in, in our neighborhood and uh, I went to ask for if they could rent me space to do my you know, lessons. And so I introduced myself, I told them who I am, they questioned me here and there, I told them, and they asked me if I have a website, anything to, they can go through, and I told them yes. I gave them, they went through it, and uh, they called me later on. And they told me, I mean, we would love to give you space, but there is a problem. We saw in your website, you believe in miracles, you believe in the Holy Spirit, you believe in signs and wonders. We don't believe in that. That ended with the apostles. It ended back then, about 2,000 years ago. But, and because of this, we cannot host you here because we have two different doctrines here. This is a church I'm talking about, y'all. It's a church. But they don't believe in the Holy... I mean, they preach God, they preach Jesus, but not the Holy Spirit. And they're going to heaven. They're still doing church, you're still doing ministry without the Holy Ghost? How? Please teach me how. Maybe I'll try, but I don't think I would survive. Traditions of men. The Bible says it's not by might, it is not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It is not in our own strength that we do these things. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples before he ascended in John 14, 12, and I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I do. Even greater works shall you do because I go back to the Father. Think about that for a moment. Truly I tell you, when Jesus says truly I tell you, it is the truth. The works you have seen me doing, you are going to do them. And even greater works shall you do. So if Jesus walked on water, we should be walking in the air. In other words. <laughs> like Spider-Man or something. <laughs> greater works shall we do because I go to the Father. Greater works. You know, back then, Jesus was, was limited while on earth. Jesus was limited. Jesus could not be at two three, two, three different places at the same time. He was limited. That's why the Bible says he walked from village to village, from town to town, from city to city with his disciples. He was not omnipresent at that time. He was 100% man, 100% God. But when he told his disciples to wait for the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is now Jesus unlimited. He is all over the earth. He is working in Africa, the same time he is working in America, the same time he's working in Asia and across the continents of the world because he is limitless. And he tells us greater things shall we do even greater than what he did. Are you ready for greater works? You need the Holy Spirit if you are ready for greater works. We need the Holy Spirit. We cannot do church. We cannot do ministry without the power of the Holy Ghost because it is the Holy Spirit that draws people to church. He is the Lord of the harvest. Let's continue back to the book of Acts chapter 4 verses 1. Now, let me take you back a little bit. When Jesus started his ministry, he picked 12, right? We all know the 12 apostles that he equipped, he trained, he taught, he did ministry with them, practical ministry. And from there, the, 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 the discipleship or the, the apostles grew from, se from 12 to 72, we're going to see that in the scriptures. And from 72, the Bible says in the upper room there were 120. So they were increasing, they were growing. And by the time Jesus left, he left 120. But on the day of Pentecost, it increased to 3,120 after Peter preached that inaugural sermon. 3,120. Now, come with me to the book of Acts chapter 1, verses 4. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests. These are the religious folks. The captain of the temple guard and the psalm of the Sadducees. They were very sad, such that they, all the names they were given were the Sadducees. As sad as you can see them. Sadducees. 
These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. They arrested them and since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. Verses 4, but many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of men who believed now totaled to about 5,000. Five thousand men, not counting women and children. The church grew by the power of the Spirit of God. The church increased by the preaching of the Word of God under the influence of the Holy Spirit. The church grew, starting with twelve that were picked from the seashore and the highways and the byways. The 12 added to 72. The 72 added to 120. The 120 to 3,120. The 3,120 to 5,000, not counting women and children. And this was as a result of them healing the crippled man in Acts chapter 3, who was at the gate called Beautiful Begging. And by the demonstration of the power of the Spirit of God in the name of Jesus, he was healed. And through that miracle, the religious folks didn't like it. And they arrested these people, but they had preached before. And even behind bars, they were still getting saved. Because of the power of the word of God that is preached under the influence of the spirit of God. Now, come with me again in Acts chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. Acts 4, 7 through 10. The Bible says, they brought in the two disciples after, after you know, imprisoning them. They brought the two disciples and demanded, by what power? By what by what power or in whose name have you done this? So these guys recognized there was a force. There was some dynamis behind these people because it was not normal. What they were doing was not normal. By what power or in whose name have you done this? Then Peter filled with what? The Holy, the Holy Spirit. He was not filled with burgers. <laughs> he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Say to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful, by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, the man you crucified but whom God raised from the dead. They asked a question, Peter answered them, under the power of the Holy Spirit. It was in Jesus' name that you crucified that this man has been healed. This man has been restored. Romans chapter 8 verses 11 says that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is the very same spirit that is living in us. It is living in you and me. The, nothing changed. The Holy Spirit was not reduced as the church continued without Jesus. The Spirit of God was the same and is still the same until today. He has not changed. He has not been uh, diminished unless we diminish him ourselves. But the Holy Spirit has not been diminished. The very same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the very same Spirit that is present with us today and living in us to work these works, to do these miracles. Acts chapter 5 verses 14 says, Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord, crowds of both men and women. Acts chapter 6 verses 7, So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests, that is the, 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 the religious guys, were also converted. As the message spread, as the Spirit of God moved and worked through these apostles, many, many were converted to become believers. Do you know what? In other words, these guys could not keep up with the count. They could not keep up with the growth. They lost count, in other words. They started very well, 12, 72, 120, 3,120, 5,000. And I, I guess the ushers came to Peter. Peter... 
<laughs> we lost count now. These people are coming. They are believing. They are getting saved. They are getting baptized. They lost count. The Holy Ghost was present. He was bringing in the harvest. He was saving the lost. He was healing the sick. He was redeeming them that were bound. The Holy Spirit was at work. Where is the Holy Ghost today? We've limited him. We've not made room for him. We have programmed him today. We have given him a schedule. And when he shows up, just when he's about to move, or oh, it's time to, 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 to pick our kids. The kids are whining. While he's just about to touch somebody's life, uh, someone holds a, a note at the back there. Pastor, time to go. There are some places that have countdown clocks. I've been there, trust me. Not, not clocks, countdown clocks. Like when the spirit is moving and you have five minutes to go, you have to cut the Holy Ghost because you have to finish the service in five minutes. I preached somewhere in Minnesota and after the service, one of these elders, elders, I call him a religious guy, came to me and told me, Pastor, that was powerful. That was a great sermon. But you went overboard. You passed the time to finish the service. And after, after the service, they are going nowhere. They go to the lobby and start having coffee and donuts. They are going nowhere. But just because it was time to end the service at 1230, they had to leave at 1230, go to the lobby to have tea and coffee for another hour or so. And, 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 and unfortunately, they are gossiping at that time. They are not even fellowshipping on what was preached. They are gossiping. In church, not outside church, this is in church. They have reduced the Holy Ghost. They have restricted him. He can only go this far. You can only come until here. We are in charge. We, are, we, we built this ministry. We know what we are talking about. The Holy Spirit has not been given room to do his work. John chapter 6, verses 44, Jesus said these words, For no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me, and at the last day I will raise them up. Nobody can come to the Father unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. Nobody can come to us until we let the spirit of the Father draw them. And he cannot draw them if we don't make room for him. He will not work his work if we don't make room for him. If we don't give him the space to minister to us, he will not do his work. Jesus said in Luke 10, verses 1 through 2, the Lord now chose 72. Talking about 72. That's why you find the number 72 in Luke 10, 1 to 2. The Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs, two by two. On, in all towns and places he planned to visit. These were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. So the problem is not the harvest. The problem is the laborers. The problem is people are not ready to go out. And this morning as I was waiting on God, he, 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 he just unveiled this to me. The reason why some people are afraid to go and testify and be witnesses and tell others about Jesus is because they don't have the Holy Ghost. Period. No question about that. If you are fearful, you are afraid of telling someone about Jesus, you don't have the Spirit of God. Because this is what the Holy Ghost does. He gives you boldness. He gives you courage. He gives you strength that is not made of man. His dunamis, it's called dunamis. That's why we find the English word dynamite. Dynamic, dunamis. Power, ability to do the things that are beyond the flesh. That is the work of the Spirit. That's why Jesus had to make sure that they don't leave that upper room. Because if they left, those demons would deal with them. The Jerusalem demons would have dealt with them real good. But they were obedient to the word and waited. And when they came out, they were not the same. They were not the same folks. 
the fearful, the tax collectors and uh, all these fishermen, they were totally transformed and changed because they were full of the power of God. Jesus sent them two by two. He knew that he had given them every power. In Luke 10, 19 says, I have given you power, I have given you authority to tread over serpents and scorpions and every principalities and powers of darkness and nothing by any means shall harm you. And in John 20, 21, before Jesus left the earth, he called them and he told them, as God sent me, I am now sending you. And he breathed on them. He breathed on them the ruach. And he told them, receive the Holy Ghost. He didn't leave them alone. He didn't leave them destitutes and wanderers and not knowing what to do next. He left them with a comforter. The Spirit of God is our comforter. He's the one who directs our path. He is a great teacher. He is the revelator. He's the one who gives us understanding of the word. Because without the Spirit of God, you will look at the Bible, you will try to read it, you will go crazy. I, I, I promise you. You will lose your mind if you read the Bible without the Spirit of God. You won't get anything, no understanding, no nothing. But the Spirit of God brings every word to life brings understanding, illuminates the word of God. That is the work of the spirit in this time and age. And in the book of Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20, the Bible says, when the 72 disciples returned, hear this, they joyfully reported to him, that is Jesus, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. You're not going out there in your name. You're not going out there because I, I, I preached and I pushed you to go there and you, you, you're going there to please me. Woe unto you and to your children. You're not going there because I, 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 the pastor wants people to come to church. The pastor has been insisting. Well, I think, I think Kim, we, we need to go just to make the pastor happy. Trust me, as much as you, you want to go out there, I want to do the same because I am accountable too. I have an account to give at the end of this life. So you're not doing this for me. You, please change if you've been thinking that way. You're not doing this to please me, to make me happy. You are doing it for your sake. Peter said this spirit is for you and your children and for those who are far. You are doing it for your good. It is for your good that you're doing this to fulfill the scriptures. Yes, the demons obey us when we... We, we use your name. Yes, he told them. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And then Jesus says in Luke 10, 19, look, I have given you authority over, uh, over all power of enemy and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. And verses 20, this is very important. But rejoice, be, rejoice not because evil spirits obey you, but simply rejoice because your names are written in the book in heaven. Your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That should be your joy. After you have done all this, because it is very easy to do all these things, like Jesus taught in John chapter 7, you know, you come to me, you do, many will come to him and say, but Jesus, didn't I prophesy? I healed the sick, I cast out demons. But Jesus will tell them, depart from me, you wicked ones. All you need to rejoice, all that should bring joy in your life is not because the demons obey you, not because many are getting saved, but because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. So church growth is not just about skills, about structure and a, and a strategy, which are all good, and we need those. But even after all these things have been put in place, the Holy Ghost needs his place in the church. Any church that preaches Jesus Christ that is God, that is the Son of God, and that he risen and conquered death forever, and he is coming back again, they should also believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because it is the Spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead, and it is the same Spirit that lives in us. Strategies, programs, and all these skills are good, but we also need to be in active partnership with the God of increase who is our Father in heaven, and he is the operator. Our Father is the operator, that is God. Then we need to be in active partnership with Jesus, who is the master builder. He is the Son of God, and he is the administrator. 
He's the one who does the administrative work. And then the Lord of the harvest, that is the Holy Ghost, who is the generator. He is the manifest, the manifester. He is the one who is working in us and through us. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond what we could ask, think, or even imagine, according to the power. There we find the word power again. According to the dynamis, the power that is at work within us. It is the power of God that is working in you, that is causing you to work the works of God. We cannot function without the works of God. We need his spirit every day of our lives. We need the power of God every single day. When we wake up in the morning, during the day's activities, when we go at night and sleep, even during the sleep, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Ghost in us. We cannot function without the Spirit of God. So if you've been here in the church for a long time, from wherever you started from, or if you've gotten saved in this place, and you don't have the Holy Spirit, I beg you by the mercies of God, ask for the Spirit of God to fill your heart and your mind and your body. The Bible calls this temple the house of the Holy Spirit. This is where he dwells. This is where he lives. And through this vessel, he functions. Through us, he does his work. We house him, but we shouldn't limit him. Let him have his way in our lives, in the church, in the body of Christ. And everywhere we go, let him come alive. At our places of work, don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid to tell anyone about Jesus. Don't be afraid to testify of the goodness of God upon your life. While everyone around you is complaining, find a reason to thank God. Don't get into their, in the, into their fold complaining as they are. Stand out and let them hear that there is something good also happening amongst some of us. But if everyone is whining and complaining, then where is God going to show himself strong? We have every reason to be grateful. Just by being alive today is a reason enough to thank God. It's a reason to be grateful and testify of God's faithfulness. Today's church, as someone said in that video, there is a gradual divorce between the church and the Holy Ghost. Without knowing, people think that they are okay, they're doing okay. But the truth is that it's not okay. We need the Spirit of God back in churches. We need the Spirit of God back in our everyday life. Not just on a Sunday morning, but every single day. It is the Spirit of God that will enable us to overcome every temptation. That, we come along, that comes along our way. It is the spirit of God that enables us to fight the principalities and powers that we face out there. We cannot do this in our own strength. We need the spirit of God in our lives. We need him desperately. I don't know about you. I, I, I think about a watchman. I don't know how desperate you are. I don't know how hungry you are. But when I, I think about the Holy Spirit and how much I need him, I compare him with the watchman. When the watchman goes to the work at night, you know, back in our country, Kenya, watch, watchmen don't, don't stay inside the building. They are outside the gates. America is blessed. Watchmen are in the building with heat and, and computers. They are, they are surveying from, from the inside. They have surveillance cameras, and that's great. I mean, bless you. In Kenya, watchmen are outside the gates, guarding the property or whatever it is, and they are not armed. All that they have maybe is a machete or uh, something. We call it rungu. I don't know what you call it in, in English. Uh, like a bat, right? Yeah, baseball bat. That's all they got. And from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning, and these watchmen at 10 p.m., I believe with all my heart, they crave for 6 a.m. to come like so quickly, just to get out of that season. That's how much we should be desperate for the Spirit of God. Like, like we can't wait. We can't wait for him to come and fill us from the crowns of our head to the soles of our feet, to our toes. I mean, we feel him everywhere, everywhere. 
That is what happened in the, in the book of Ezekiel 37. When Ezekiel prophesied to the dry bones, he breathed, the, he spoke, and the Spirit of God went to the dry bones. And the dry bones started coming together. And there, there was a break dance happening in the valley of the dry bones. And they were coming together because there was power right there. And the dry bones, the neck bone connected to the shoulder bones and the, and the knees bone. And there was some break dance. And I mean, they came live. There was life right there. The Spirit of God brings life. When you stand before people and forget about yourself, the Spirit of God takes over. You will speak things that when you watch the clip, you won't believe you are the one speaking. Because it was not you. It was God taking over your life. You cannot just stand before people and you're dry. By the way, I love dry, I li I love, I love dry things. I like dry things. You know what about, one thing I like about dry things, they catch fire quickly. So if you're here and you feel dry, you're in the right place. You're going to catch fire so very quickly. And then you will be all over the place. You will be ablaze. Everywhere you go, people will be feeling the heat of the Holy Spirit. Everywhere you go, you pass. People will just be like, whoa. You'll be leaving some residue right there. And change. Change. Everywhere you go, it's just change. The Bible says everywhere Jesus went, he didn't leave any wrong testimony there. He did good to everyone. Those he met that were blind received their sight. Those that were dead, they came back to life. Those that were lame, they went back home walking. Because Jesus was in the business of healing. But you know what? It is God who anointed him. He didn't just anoint him. He anointed him with the Holy Ghost. Read the book of Acts 10.38. How God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and with power. I love that. He anointed him with the Holy Ghost and with power. That everywhere he went, he did nothing but good. And tell you what, Acts 10, 34, just a few scriptures before that, the Bible says that God is not a respecter of persons. Nobody is better than you. All that he needs is just someone available to be used. That's all. Just say, Lord, here I am, like Isaiah chapter 6. Here I am, Lord, use me. Just use me. What you want me to say, where you want me to go, what you want me to do, I mean, I'm all yours. Spirit of God, take over. That's all he's looking for. And when you do that, man, you're in for a ride. A good ride. Because what you will see are the things that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for his beloved. Now, if you're beloved of God, if you believe that you are beloved of God, then get ready for the more of God for the Holy Spirit just to come and sweep over and then let him have his way. Shall we stand up on our feet as we're going to pray? I believe that God is up to something in this place. God is up to something in this place. There's one video I was watching with my wife the other day and, uh, there's one in the, and uh, this person said there's only one thing that God and Satan agree upon, agree on. And this is the thing. God and Satan never use lazy people. Both God and Satan never use lazy people. You're coming to church, is like... I mean, you're regretting it Sunday. I wish it was Saturday I would sleep in. I mean, when David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of... You should be excited about church. Every time you, you wake up and you, you know it's Sunday morning, man, you can't wait to be in the house of God. But Sunday, oh man, people from the parking lot. Oh, I forgot something in the car. <laughs> man. Man, you should walk bold, courageous. You know who you are in Christ. You know where you are heading to. You know what you are carrying inside of you. You have the power of the Spirit of God. You are not your own. Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but the life of Jesus is in me. Jesus never, I don't recall reading anywhere, Jesus dragged himself to the tomb of Lazarus. No. Jesus was so bold. Everywhere he went, he was so courageous until the, those religious guys were like, man, this kid at the age of 12 with all this wisdom, and with this authority that is God, it was the Spirit of God in him. We cannot do this thing in our own strength, church. 
We cannot. And I promise you this one thing. If we all embrace the Holy Spirit and not limit him, but let him work in and even through us, you will be surprised. I promise you that. You will be surprised. I mean, personally, I have seen miracles that until today I'm still in awe. So miracles should be a norm. But I remember in Minnesota, just before we moved here, we prayed for someone over the phone. Until today, I've never met her. But we prayed over a certain lady that had lung cancer, a Hispanic lady. And we prayed over her over the phone. And she went to the doctor the following week, and no trace of cancer was found. Not one was found. I have never met her until today, but her daughter always, always, she went all over the place telling people how her mother got healed of cancer. I mean, we've seen people getting saved, getting transformed. The other day, uh, we, we met this uh, couple, and uh, one thing uh, that encouraged me a lot is that when they came here, the, the, the only message they've been hearing is just about people getting saved, that all that we preach in this place is souls, souls, souls. And that alone has, has, has made them even embrace this ministry. We cannot win souls without the Spirit of God. We cannot preach salvation without the Spirit of God. We need the Spirit of God everywhere, especially in this time and age. And what is, is, around, what is happening around us? Without the Spirit of God, some of us would have lost their soul.